Hello and welcome to our Tuesday afternoon uh, noontime webinar. Today we're going to be talking about teams, channels, groups, and site governance, automation, and external sharing. Long uh, bit of a mouthful there, I know, but teams, of course, being front and center for a lot of folks right now, either just rolling it out or getting right into it, and governance and automation around that is a, a very hot topic. So I thought we'd do this month's webinar on that. I'm going to start with a quick introduction. My name is Peter Carson. I'm the president of Extranet User Manager. I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so. Also in Office Apps and Services, uh, Microsoft MVP. My contact details are here. We're going to be publishing the uh, the recording and the slide deck up on our website, so you'll get a follow-up email with the details for that, so you'll have all my contact details in there. Um, also online, we've got Logan Guest. Logan is our uh, manager of sales here at Extranet User Manager. He's the one that sent out the invitations and uh, calendar invites and such, and he'll be sending the follow-up out. Um, so if you've got any questions, by all means, reach out with him. He can be your prime point of contact from that point of view. For those of you not familiar with Extranet User Manager, and, and today's session is, is predominantly not on this topic, but I thought I'd give a little background here. Um, we're, we're a product built to provide a management of a digital community external to your organization. So we have clients all around the world um, using the, the product, and we're going to touch on some of the use cases for that just at the end of this webinar. Let's just go into our agenda of what we're going to be focusing on for the most part. Uh, so we've done our introductions, uh, a little bit of background, then we'll go a little deeper into the Office 365 suite that's going to provide the context, do a little level set from that point of view. And then we're going to dive right into provisioning. And, and I'll speak more about what that means, but basically around um, how do you provide some governance and structure around self-service requests for new Microsoft Teams, for Office 365 groups, for SharePoint team sites, which are all very much interrelated, which we'll also talk about there as well. We'll take you through a demo of, of an open source solution that we built for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll wrap up by just touching on external sharing and how you want, may want to engage people external to your organization as part of what we're looking at here today. We do have the uh, the questions section open through the whole session, so feel free to, to ask questions as you're going through. Logan um, will be doing his best to answer those as we go through. If we've got some outstanding at the end and we've got some time, we'll address those as well or we can follow up uh, following the webinar from there. So first and foremost, though, I, I just want to let everybody know the uh, the reminder email that went out and last week mentioned this. We've got a new page up on our Extranet User Manager site that's all about Teams provisioning. So it's really about the topic that we're talking about here today. Um, I do have a to-do task on my side. I, I did write uh, two versions of a site provisioning white paper last year, uh, and I've got a new one that I'm working on right now that's going to cover what we're, we're looking at here today about the team side of things and channels and, and where we've taken in that whole side there. Uh, may actually break it out into two white papers, one more business focused from a, a business case point of view, and then one more targeted towards an IT pro in terms of how do you take our open source components and actually deliver that into your environment. Uh, we do have the, the second version of the last year's site provisioning white paper link up there in the interim, uh, so that's got a lot of good details in there too. Uh, we do have a Teams resources page, it says coming soon there. We've actually launched that up in the last couple of days as well. Uh, so lots of links from an end user and administrator point of view and if you're looking at rolling out Teams. We've got my business case article for site provisioning, uh, today's webinar, and then a recording of a webinar that I did back at the end of the summer um, on this topic as well. So we will refresh this page post this webinar. We've got some additional resources, some sections around the GitHub um, open source components that I want to put up there on there as well. So this will really become our go-to spot for this topic. Now, before we get into the, the webinar itself, I always like to get a sense of the folks that are here and, uh, and what sort of background they have. So let me just ask a quick poll here. It's fairly simple. You know, do you currently use Office 365 or SharePoint on-premises? How about Microsoft Teams? Um, are you using Microsoft Flow or Logic Apps? If you're not sure what those are, don't worry. We'll we'll get into that. Um, and anybody leveraging the the Microsoft Patterns and Practices suite. So we'll give everybody a minute to respond to the poll, and then we'll share the results back with everybody. Okay, let me give you about 10 more seconds if you haven't had a chance to respond yet. Let me close that out. And just share that back with everybody. Um, so number keeps getting higher and higher on the Office 365 side. We, we 
I suppose we'll eventually hit 100% there. We're getting pretty darn close, so that's uh, that's awesome. But a lot of people still using SharePoint on-premises as well, so I guess there's a lot of hybrid implementations out there. 85% Microsoft Teams, that's awesome. Um, I'm a big fan of Teams. We converted our uh, our office to Teams about a year, two years ago, and then about a year ago, we, we did the final switch off of Skype for Business from a telco point of view, and we're 100% Teams. I love it. it uh, it's a great way to communicate internally as an organization. Uh, about half the folks using either Flow or Logic Apps, which are closely related. We'll talk about differences and similarities between those. Um, a few folks using Patterns and Practices, which is part of the, the SharePoint templating that we're going to touch on later in the session as well. Let me just hide that, come back to our deck, and let's dive right in. So I probably don't need to spend too much time on the, the team side, given that 85% uh, of people are using Teams here today. I mean, for those of you not aware, if you're still using Skype for Business, October 2020 is the drop dead date if you're using the online versions that Microsoft's uh, ceasing the, the Skype for Business products. So Teams is really the direction from that point of view, but it's so much more than, than Skype for Business. I mean, a lot of people, uh, when they first start using it, just use it from a, a chat and presence and audio and video calling point of view, where I really find the value is the persistent chat and the ability to to create channels and, and organize things, and we'll talk about what those are and, and how we use those in Vision IT as we get into our session. Now, anytime you create a, a Microsoft team, you're also creating what's called an Office 55 group under the hood for that. And, and this is an updated version of Matt Wade's famous diagram. I've used it quite often in, uh, in different sessions. I've got a link to the, the current version of it on his site there as well. Um, and basically what this is explaining to people is when I create one of these things across the top, like a, a team, or maybe I create a, a SharePoint team site, uh, what it's doing is it's actually creating an Office 65 group. So I'm getting a bunch of things underneath that as well. You know, in addition to the SharePoint site or the, the Microsoft team that I might be expecting, I actually get a, a dedicated inbox and shared calendar specific to that group. I get a planner plan, a OneNote notebook, a forms workspace. You know, if I'd created it through Yammer, I also get a, a Yammer feed as part of that as well. So, you know, you actually get a lot of things spun up for you uh, just by nature of creating a, a Microsoft team. And, and that's good and bad. I mean, the, the, the great part is you've got a lot of functionality available to you. Uh, the bad is if, if people are kind of willy-nilly spinning up teams, you don't have a lot of governance around that, you're going to get all these resources and all these different tools spun up as part of that, and it can become a bit of a wild west. Uh, now, the solution I'm talking about here today actually started on the SharePoint side. You know, this was kind of pre-Teams. We had a provisioning uh, uh, solution around SharePoint to say, hey, when you want to create a SharePoint site, can you have some process around that? And, and it depends on the type of site that we're talking about. I like this slide here. It kind of explains the, the three different styles of, of SharePoint sites. And the first one is actually OneDrive for Business, which is built on the SharePoint platform. So it's private by default. It's for your personal files. You can share with others in there. But if it becomes, say, a project site, for example, you know, it doesn't really belong there. It should be a, a team site, which is all about the collaboration, you know, sharing content with your group. Um, everybody's an author working in there typically uh, versus a communication site, which is about the, the broader communications where you want to, say, have a, a corporate portal or intranet from a staff communications point of view. Communication sites are great from that point of view. But we're going to focus in on the, the SharePoint team sites, so that middle one that we're talking about there. So by default, you know, all members are content authors. You can secure that. You can have read-only. You can have a designers, you know, different roles within SharePoint, and it doesn't need to be site-wide. You can have different libraries or folders or documents have their own permissions in there as well. Now, initially, when you create a Microsoft team, it creates a SharePoint team site underneath. It connects those permissions together. So you've got members and owners on the team side that correspond to rights that you have in the SharePoint team sites. I know the naming gets a little confusing because we're talking about teams from a Microsoft Teams point of view and team sites from a SharePoint point of view. Um, unfortunately, we can't really avoid that confusion. <laughs> That's the way they named the product, and it is what it is. Uh, but we're going to drill a little deeper even from, from there, and we're going to focus in on project sites. And what I talk about today is not specific just to project sites, but they're really a, a good example uh, that kind of illustrates the need for what we're talking about here. And this is actually a talk that I've been giving for, for quite a number of years, even, even pre-Teams point of view of, of leveraging SharePoint and then Office 65 groups, and then more recently now Teams, as part of your project management methodology. Um, and, and first and foremost, as I mentioned, you know, we fully adopted Teams. Microsoft Teams is our place for, for project manager member communication. 
you get a SharePoint team site as part of that, but you can actually template that. And I'll show you what that looks like and, and how we achieve that with our solution. So we can have you know multiple document libraries, custom lists, different things in there, sharing with external users all as part of that. One note for, for note taking, I'm a big fan of, we're going to talk more about that, planner for, for task management. Uh, Stream is actually great for conference call recordings. We do this a lot now when we do online team meetings, either video or audio only calls and desktop sharing. You know, we want to be able to go back and, and look at what was discussed in that meeting. Um, you can record the meeting through Teams and it actually goes into Stream. And we can set up groups and channels in, in Stream and coordinate that with Teams and actually provide some organization back and forth from that point of view. Now you've still got um, an email box and, and calendar in there. Uh, you've got a shared version of that as part of the Office 65 group. So that can be still used for people that aren't on Teams that, that you'd still want to do through email. And you may have other external systems, you know, a financial system, a time tracking, bug tracking, depends on the context of the project, what you might want to pull in as part of that. Uh, now I net mentioned OneNote, and, and I am a huge fan of OneNote as well. So, so we use OneNote extensively. We don't use the wiki features in Teams. We we prefer to use OneNote. Um, it's nice because it's got a, a co-authoring experience, so multiple people can be in the same OneNote at the same time. They see each other's changes. Uh, you can sync it to your desktop as well as your mobile versions of OneNote. You can have it offline. You know, it, it really works well from that point of view. And we can create sections and pages and add all sorts of content in through there as part of that. Cool thing is OneNote is actually free. You don't even need to be a, an Office 65 or even an Office customer of Microsoft. Anybody can go to the Microsoft site, download and install OneNote for, for free. So if you want to use it for, for personal note taking, I have my own personal notebooks as well as all of our client and project OneNotes. Uh, it works really well from that point of view. Uh, Planner. Planner is a, a simple task management tool within Office 365. So it's not a replacement for project server. You're not going to run a, a massive, you know, decade-long construction project with resource leveling across a bunch of different organizations and things like that. It's not built with that in mind. What it's built for is simple task management. I've got a, a simple project and, and I need a spot to track the to-dos that need to be done on that. Uh, to-do being a Microsoft product from a personal focus point of view, how do we do that from a group project point of view. Some of the cool things that were announced to Ignite back in the fall um, is that Planner and To-Do are actually starting to integrate. So as I've got task assignment in Planner, I see them in To-Do combined with my personal task as well. So a nice way to keep track of all that. And then I mentioned Stream. Um, you know, pr predominantly from a Teams point of view, the Teams puts its recording into Streams. But think of it, Stream as your uh, your private YouTube for your organization. You know, it is private to your Office 365. It's not public. Um, in fact, in some cases, we want to share those recordings with clients. We can't do that yet from Stream. So we're still looking for some new features from that point of view. In fact, even some of the automation stuff we'd like to do in terms of setting Stream up for how we want to use it with Teams. Again, we're waiting for some. API features for Microsoft. But still, there's a lot there. It's got some really cool stuff, you know, things like the speech to text. So it'll actually provide a, a written dictation of what was discussed during your call, uh, which is really handy from a search point of view. You can search through that um, call transcript, get to a certain point, uh, click on it, and the video actually goes right to that point and starts playing at that point in the conversation. So if you've got a, you know, an hour long, two hour long conference call, it's got a lot of points discussed in there, you want to get right to the right spot, that really helps navigate through from that point of view. All right, so let's focus in now on our, our main topic for today, which is around the provisioning question. You know, how do we provision Teams, Office 65 groups, and SharePoint sites? And, and if we go back to Matt's diagram, um, you know, this is great. I've got self-service um, creation enabled by default, and I can create Teams, I can create SharePoint sites, I can create groups in Outlook, you know, and all these things are interconnected, and that's wonderful, um, except that it can get out of control. You know, you may have, multiple teams set up for the same project and, and some people are in one and some are in the other and it gets confusing. So how do you better manage that? Well, the first thing is, you know, we recommend that you actually turn off the self-service out of the box features uh, just because you don't have the appropriate controls in there. Now that sounds a little scary. Hey, you know, does that mean that everybody now starts emailing somebody in IT saying, hey, I need a team. Hey, I need a SharePoint site. Um, no, you don't want to go to manual provisioning as well. You want to make sure from an adoption point of view, it's still easy for people to, to request and get those resources that they need, but that there's appropriate governance and structure in as part of that. 
and, and that's really the better way that we're going to talk about here today. You know, that we've got um, some sort of self-service form that people can come to, they can fill out. We've got some automation around that from an approvals point of view if we need to. And ultimately, we create the, the teams, the SharePoint sites, the, the planner plans, the OneNotes, you know, all the various different elements that we need to successfully run that project. And there are third-party alternatives to that. I mean, we've open sourced everything that we've done. So the, the stuff that I'm going to be showing you, the SharePoint framework web parts, the, the scripts and everything else, that's all freely available. There's no charge associated with that. We can provide consulting services if you want it customized to your specific implementation. But you can also look at things like Vattle Teamwork. Uh, we are a Vattle partner. We love their internet product, uh, the, the Teamwork provides sort of a, a alternative solution from a, a requesting team's point of view. Avpoint has a similar solution. Sharegate, we love their, their migration tools. They actually have a, a tool for managing teams and groups. Less about the upfront governance before these are all created and more about managing a mess that, that results if you leave the self-service open. You know, how do you identify orphan teams, teams with owners, duplicate teams and things like that and kind of tidy that up. So, you know, interesting uh, approach. I like to deal with it beforehand, but sometimes you don't get to, and, and you've got to sort of keep on top from a, a what's what's out there in running point of view. And from a retention and disposal point of view, I can see using Apricot for that as well. And, and that's one thing that we haven't addressed in our solution just yet is, you know, what's the life cycle at the end? Uh, when should get a team get deleted? How does it get archived? You know, those are things for the future that I'm still thinking about uh, that we need to address as part of that as well. Okay, so what are our requirements? You know, if, if I was the business owner and I said, hey, I want to provide governance around this whole Teams and Office 65 groups thing, what is that going to look like? Well, first and foremost, it needs to be self-service. You know, it can't be people emailing other people to do things. You know, that's just not a scalable way of, of doing this. So some way that people can fill out a form um, and, and start this process going. Now we may want approvals on that, and it may not be a, an all or nothing. You know, maybe certain scenarios, um, requests for certain departments or certain types of teams require approvals, and, and that may dictate who the approvers are, while other ones may be wide open and, and there's no approval required. Again, it's gonna depend on your organization and what kind of structure you wanna put in place from that. But if we need approvals, we wanna make sure it's easy to do that. Um, it needs to be extensible and customizable for each organization. Every, every business is different. Um, every organization has its own way of doing things and you know what other systems they pull in, what their templates look like, what their architecture looks like. So how do we make that easily extensible? We want to leverage out, out of the box, but we also want to provide uh, templating so that we can have customized templates for not just the SharePoint sites, but the Microsoft Teams, uh, the OneNotes, the, everything that's involved as part of this solution. Obviously, uh, modern sites are here to stay. Uh, they're much nicer than the old classic SharePoint sites. So we want to support those. We want to support uh, the Office of Five groups, that whole structure, and of course, Microsoft Teams, which is really what uh, a lot of folks I think are interested in right now. And, and lastly, we didn't want this to be a highly complex uh, solution. There is complexity. You do probably need to be an IT pro. It's not a, you know, a power user type of solution. There is some um, administrative skills need to get this going, but we didn't want you to have to fire up Visual Studio and deal with C Sharp code and things like that that you need a hardcore developer for. Um, effectively, any IT pro that's comfortable in PowerShell should be able to wire the pieces together and get this up and running for their organization. So that was our requirements of, of what we're looking for from a solution point of view. So from a supporting technology point of view, what does that mean? Um, we, we started with Microsoft Flow, which is now Power Automate. Recently, there's been some licensing changes. I'm going to talk more about that. We switched it to Azure Logic Apps, which is actually the underlying technology that's underneath Power Automate um, as the workflow engine that drives this whole process. Uh, SharePoint is part of the piece here. We use SharePoint frameworks and some SharePoint lists to kind of hold the whole process together. Um, and then we use some PowerShell and Azure Automation to actually do the heavy lifting and the work from there. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to give you a, a scenario of how we use this at Envision IT. And a number of our clients are closely modeling on, on what we do, particularly consulting organizations that deal with projects and clients, because um, that model um, maps across quite easily. Um, but like I said before, this is not a, a be all and end all for everybody. You know, tweak it and take it what, uh, as appropriate to your organization. But this will give you some context around that. So at Envision IT, we're an Office 65 consulting company. Uh, we're the parent company for Xternet User Manager. Um, and what we want to do is, is really embrace teams and groups and, and team sites is how we work with our clients. 
So basically what we do is we create a Microsoft team for each client. And when we create that team, of course, we're going to get the, the Office 55 group and the modern team site underneath that. And that also comes with the OneNote notebook, the stream group, the planner plan, all of which we leverage as, as part of the work we do with that client. And then we decided uh, we want to keep projects independent from each other and, and keep them organized, Teams has a concept called channels. And I'll show you what this means in a, in a minute when we get into the demo side of it. But basically, they're a way to organize both documents and conversations related to that channel. So that construct made a lot of sense to say, well, we don't want a whole new team for every project we do for every client because we can do multiple projects every year for every client. Um, that's too many teams to manage. But having a channel for every project makes a lot of sense from that point of view. Um, and, and what happens when you create a channel, it automatically creates a folder in SharePoint to keep the documents organized from that point of view. But what we wanted to do is we said, okay, well, we're big OneNote fans. OneNote has this idea of sections. So if we think about we have a OneNote notebook for each client, why don't we have a section for each project and connect that to the, the channel and the project concept as well? In fact, Stream has channels as well, but they're not connected to the Teams channels. They're very same name, but very independent from each other. Um, and our longer term goal, once we've got some hooks to be able to automate things in Stream, is to actually create the channel in Streams when the, the channel create is created in Teams and connect all those together. Likewise, you can create multiple plans in one Office 65 group, so create a new plan and planner for that new project. Um, and then you'll you'll find if if you're not using Teams a lot yet, uh, you'll discover as you use it more and more, the, the goal of the engineering group behind Teams is that you should live in the Teams interface itself. And there's tabs in there that you can connect all this up. Uh, so let's automate the, the setting up of those tabs as part of that. So that's really the scenario of how we're using it. So a team for every client and a channel for every project. So, so when you request the team, you're gonna get those elements. This just kind of reiterates what we just talked about there. But how do you actually do that request? I mentioned at the beginning in our requirements, we wanted to have a self-service form as part of this. So lo and behold, we have our SharePoint Framework web part that we've built to, to actually allow you to make these requests, whether you're requesting a team, a site, or what have you from there. Now, it has a fair bit of complexity in it. You can actually hide some of that complexity depending on your organization. Uh, first and foremost, we have this concept of divisions. So you may have multiple divisions, and that may drive what sort of templates are available for people to choose depending on what division they work with. Uh, that could also be used as part of your approvals process to say, okay, well, who's the approver for this division or for this template that's been chosen? You know, out of the box, it doesn't have that complexity in there, but the beauty of using Logic Apps as our workflow engine, it's actually really easy to, to build those sorts of rules in there um, and add that complexity where it needs to be. The, the name of the team, the purpose, uh, the alias that's going to be used for the underlying um, shared mailbox that gets created in exchange. Is this a public group or not, which means can people see it and self-discover it and join it? Um, and do you actually want to create a team as part of this as well? And a lot of these options can be turned off, so you don't actually see that. You, know, you can say, well, we're not going to use the division concept. We only have one template. Or we always want it to be a public group, and we always want to create a team. Just take those choices away. You're left with three boxes from there. You can go the other way, though, as well. You can actually add more fields to this form. So if you've got things that you want to capture, uh, maybe for other line of business uh, systems that are becoming part of this process, um, or just tracking information that you want to track from a metadata point of view against your projects, you can extend this out very easily. And you don't need to be a developer to do that. It's all based off of content types in SharePoint. So you just add more columns to the content type. The form magically um, updates itself, adds those fields to it, and, and away you go from there. So it's actually really easy to, to add your customization to that. Now, we have a couple of other web parts related to this. So every time that you, you create a team, you get a SharePoint site underneath as part of that. We actually have a sites list web part uh, that lets you discover those sites. So if you want to uh, provide easy navigation, we use this on, on our site. We have a, a client's site that we, we use as a parent for a lot of the sites that we create. And we use that bottom A to Z web part view on there to say, okay, here's a quick navigation to get to any of our client sites and down into the projects from there. Um, so you can use it in a variety of different ways from that point of view. And this is all included as part of the open source solution. So both of these SharePoint Framework web parts that I was talking about are available through there. And the nice thing, I mean, they're called SharePoint Framework web parts, but they don't have to just be used in SharePoint. We can actually use it in Teams as well. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute too. So with that, let's actually switch over to our demo side and have a look at what that looks like. 
So I'm going to start up at the, the top of our EUM demo SharePoint tenant. So this is the one that we use for our live demos. Um, if you've gone through our test drive section of our external user manager website, it's actually wired into this tenant as well. So you can actually self-register, come into some of the sites that are in this tenant. Uh, we haven't lit it up yet, but I've actually been thinking about lighting this site up uh, so you can register on our external user manager site and actually come in and experience a lot of the functionality um, of what we've done on the provisioning side of things here as well. I don't think we'd allow you to actually create the teams and create the sites. That's a little too far to go um, in our tenant. That's something we'd wanted to have you do in your tenant, uh, but it would at least get you to, to get a flavor for that. So if I come in here um, and, and think of this as your your landing page for Microsoft Teams in your organization. Now this one is built for our demo purposes that you would tweak and, and tailor it a bit differently for your organization, uh, but it would be a place for everybody to come to to say, hey, I want to request a new team. But let's also have some Teams resources. And this actually flips over to our resources page on the, the website, but you'd want to take it to a, an internal page within your intranet you know, that explains Teams adoption and best practices and how you use it in your organization, all those sort of self-service resources. You might have some videos in there stored in stream um, as part of that. So people understand from a change management point of view how they should be using Teams. I've got some other things in here around, uh, you know, the, the solution under the hood, the SharePoint framework web parts, but let's dive right into the request a team here. So this brings up a page with the uh, the SharePoint framework web part that I was talking about. And the first question we have to answer is, well, what division do we want to have? This is a demo environment. All we have is demos, which are permanent and temporary demos that go away. They get cleaned up here, obviously, so they don't clutter up our demo environment. And we have a choice of a number of different uh, site templates that we want to use. You know, do we want to create a modern team site? or say a communication site. We have some extra user manager specific ones. We actually have a modern client site, which is our template from the Envision IT side of how we engage with our consulting clients. Now, normally for this talk, I would choose modern team site. The only challenge is it actually takes a while for the provisioning to happen. There's a lot of things happening in the hood from Microsoft when it's creating that team and creating that Office 55 group and wiring and all that together. It can take anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour for that process to happen. So we don't have time on the call for that. So I'm going to do two things. <clears throat> I'm going to choose, well, let me choose modern team site quickly just to, to show you here. <coughs> You know, we have the options to create the, the public group and create the team. And we can configure this so it defaults to yes, that it doesn't even ask us that question. We can set all that up. When I do those, I'm going to flip it over to modern communication site. The reason I'm going to do that is that's the lightest version. It's, it's just a SharePoint site, and it doesn't have any team or anything else behind it. It usually takes one or two minutes, and that, uh, that comes up live. You can see here it's created the URL for me. It's gone and checked to make sure that that's available um, and looks good from that point of view. So I can go ahead and submit that. Actually, I do need to do a quick change. Oh. And what this has done is that I actually submitted it to a SharePoint list. So if we come back to our homepage here, we look at some of the, uh, the under the hood here. There's a number of lists that drive this process. And, and bear with me for a sec. I just got an email saying, hey, approval just got requested for that site that we just requested. Let's, let me go get that started. Now, we haven't fully done the switch over from Flow to Logic Apps. We've kind of got half and half right now. This particular one is still running as a Flow. So let me come into my approval section. I can see, hey, here's a site request for our webinar demo two that we saw there. I can flip over and see the details on that, or if that all looks good, I just say approve and go ahead and confirm that. So you can see from a self-service point of view, that's ideal. You know, I could fill out the form with what I wanted, and then approver reviews that, makes sure that's okay, um, says good, approved, and that starts the process running from there. So under the hood, there's actually a sites list here that drives that whole process. So we can see here's our, our webinar demo two that we just put in there, um, about to get created. So it's actually running through right now. So it actually hasn't created the site just yet. But actually, if I go back to my SharePoint framework web parts, so these are all the different web parts that we provide, um, not just as part of our open source solution, but there's a number of web parts that we provide with our external user manager product as well. Uh, the top three are, are what come as the, the open source solution. So I showed you the site request one. Let's go over to the sites list one. So we can see a number of different flavors for this. We've got an A to Z, 
through here. Uh, we've got a, a tile view and we've just got a straight list view of those. So I've got a, a number of different sites available that I can choose from. Let's go ahead and choose that webinar demo one. And this is actually a site that I created earlier today. So this is a SharePoint Modern Team site. Um, it's up and ready to, to go here. I haven't applied much to it, but I did use the Envision IT client um, template for that. So it did do some specific things. If we look on the left here, we'll see we don't just have a, a shared documents library, we actually have a private documents library as well. And this will come up more in context when we get to the, uh, the end of the session, because when we share our client sites with our clients externally, um, we want to share the site as a whole, except for the, the private clients. So that's, or sort of the private documents. That's kind of our working area for things that we're not ready to share with our clients yet, but everything else is wide open and transparent from that point of view. So they can see all the documents that are in the SharePoint documents. And, and we'll come into these folders in a minute. They're actually created as part of the Teams side of things. So I can actually see all this through the Teams side as well. So here I've got my, my Teams tab. Um, and here is the webinar demo team that was created as part of that request as well. Um, and these are the channels that I was talking about here. So it's a way to organize content. So as I'm down in here, um, you know, I've got dry run one here. These are what are called persistent conversations. And, and this is a great way to organize your communication within your team around your projects. And the reason is if, if people just come to the chat feature in Teams, and if you're used to Skype for Business, that's probably what you would do. And we only have one user in this demo tenant, so I can't actually chat back and forth with other people. But those are direct conversations between those people. Uh, the challenge, though, is that you know, if we're doing that chat back and forth about this project that we've got running here, only the people on that chat have visibility to that. And the big advantage of Teams is this idea of persistent chat, that anybody that joins this webinar demo team, whether they join them today or six months or a year from now, they see all of that history. And, and that's really, really important. You know, in the old days, if you work through email, you know, all that knowledge is locked up in people's inboxes. And as project members leave a project, their inbox leaves with them and all that history is gone. And somebody new joins a project six months in on the project, they start with an empty inbox and they, they don't see any of that history there. With Teams, that all changes because you've got that visibility that everybody that belongs to the team can see how this all hangs together and can search and, and go through all that history through there. You know, and as a, as a project gets busy, you're going to see lots of threads in this threaded conversation. You know, it's important to get some best practices. You know, if, if you've got something to say about this particular comment that's in here, you know, make sure you don't start a new conversation, that you reply to it through here and start working through it. So, you know, making sure that people understand best practices around how they use Teams, how they tag people in conversations so they get alerted. That's a whole different topic, but that's really important to your organization as well. But let's say, you know, if I'm up here, Actually, let me uh, let me come to to this particular team right here. So I'm going to flip back to my deck for a minute and, and talk more about the channel side of things. So I mentioned this concept of channels in Teams and how we use them from a project point of view, and that there's a number of things that we want to have happen when somebody creates a new team channel. You know, we don't just want the channel in Teams. We want a OneNote section in OneNote. We want a new planner plan. Maybe we want a, a new channel in Streams and we want to wire the tabs up all to those. Now, we don't have all this running in our demo environment. Some of it we can't quite do yet, like the stream stuff. We just don't have the hooks from Microsoft <coughs> to be able to automate that. But let me show you what we've done so far and give you a sense of you know, the art of possible and where things are going. So let's imagine that the webinar demo is, is one of our um, clients, and we want to start a new project with them. So normally what I would do in Teams is I would come to the ellipse here, and I would say I want to add a channel. Now, I've talked to the, the engineering group in, in Redmond. We can't remove this ad channel, so you kind of have to educate people, hey, you know, don't add channel directly through Teams. Everybody can. What we want to do is we've actually added a SharePoint framework web part by default to every team that gets created called add channel. And the reason we want people to do this is because we want to do more than just add the channel to Teams. We want to do all those other things that we were talking about. So let's call this one live demo. Um, and we have some options here around privacy, whether it's a, you know, we now have the, the private channel side. This part we can't support yet either. Um, again, waiting for 
hooks from Microsoft to be able to, to automate those processes. So as Microsoft brings out new features like private channels, so they don't always give us as developers the ability to, to automate those processes, but it should be coming fairly soon from that point of view. We've left the box there just to illustrate the concept. But let's leave it as a standard and go ahead and add that channel in there. So what it's done is it hasn't actually directly added it to Teams, just like we did with Sites, we've actually set up a, um, sorry, let me get back to my main landing page, a list to manage those channel requests. So if I come back over here and I look at my team channels, I can see here's my live demo channel that I've requested. And it, it's telling me what uh, site that corresponds to, so we know how to wire it back and connect it up properly from there. And this is an example where we're actually using Logic Apps to drive this. So we don't have an approval process on this one right now, uh, but if I come over here to my Teams channel processing, um, it'll pull it every minute or so to look for ones, but I'm going to run the trigger just to kick it and make it run a little faster from there. Actually, it may have already started. We can see it there running. Now, if, if you're not familiar with Logic Apps, um, don't be afraid of them. They're actually very similar to the experience in Power Automate. In fact, if I come in and edit this particular Logic App, uh, the designer that I see is identical to the designer I see in, in Power Automate. I can create my triggers in the same way. In this case, we're doing a trigger off of uh, a new item getting created in that Teams channel list that I was showing you in that SharePoint site. And here it's saying, hey, every minute, pull and, and look for new items in there. When you see something, you know this is where we would add an approval step in here. Now, approvals are not supported out of, the, out of the box in Logic Apps. We've actually done a fair bit of work to build our own approval process in Logic Apps uh, that we're going to be open sourcing out as part of this whole solution as well. So that part is, is baked and running in one of our other tenants. We just haven't got it over into the demo tenant here. But basically what it's doing is calling out to Azure Automation. And, and Azure Automation is a way to run PowerShell scripts in the cloud. Uh, which is perfect for things like this where we you know the the workflow is running in the cloud it's going to call out to an azure subscription to particular resource resource group and automation account and say run this run book and there's a bunch of powershell script inside this run book that then creates that team channel so that's actually where the heavy lifting happens is is in that powershell script so let's uh just go back here so we can see that that script actually succeeded so i can look at the the run through says, hey, it took about a minute to, to run that job. You know, it passed through the, the ID of the, the channel list item that we wanted through there. So if I come back to my Teams, lo and behold, there's our new channel. Now, the interesting thing is when I go to that channel, um, yes, I've got my post section for my persistent conversations. I've got my file section. In fact, if I come back to here for a minute, let's go to the, the SharePoint site. Apologies about jumping around a bit. We've got all these different components that are all wired together. Here's our webinar demo. And if I come back to my shared documents, we can see it's created a live demo folder in here. So when we're in Teams and we go to this Files tab here, we're not actually looking at files that are in Teams. What we're looking at is files that are stored in this live demo folder over here. So actually, let me pop open uh, Windows Explorer for a second here. I just want to get to my demo files. There we go. So I've got a bunch of documents on my local system. Let me just grab those, drag those into SharePoint. It's uploading them. Boom, we've got our new documents there. If I come over to Teams, I might need to refresh this. Let me just go away from files for a second, come back in. There's our new documents there. In fact, I can do the same thing over here. I can grab one of these other documents and drag it into the team side. It's uploading one file there. So everything I can do on the SharePoint side, I can do on the team side. In fact, if I come over to the SharePoint, again, sometimes I need to refresh. Sometimes the things show up. There's always a bit of a delay there, but there's my change request documents that I just dragged in. So it doesn't really matter which I'm in, whether I'm in SharePoint or Teams, I'm seeing the same file repository from there. And that all happened automatically. That wasn't part of our provisioning stuff. That was out of the box Teams functionality. Uh, but where it gets interesting is where we've linked OneNote into here. So remember, OneNote gets created for every Office 365 group and SharePoint team site. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that the tabs get set up in Teams. So by default, we don't want to get a tab into the OneNote. Uh, but also, 
that we've created a new section to correspond to that new channel that we've created. So if I open the OneNote itself, we see here we've got a, a section for that channel that we've created. So imagine this is our project. We can keep all of our uh, project meeting notes, you know, different uh, pages we can create through here, whatever that case may be. If I come back over into Teams, you know, again, I'm going to see that as I come back into the OneNote tab through here. And that's all going to live connect back and forth. So if I'm doing changes in one, I'm going to see them in the other. Through there, it's a really great way to, to organize things. So we have, you know, OneNotes for every one of our clients, all our project stuff in there, you know, quick links, jot notes, meeting notes. That's a great way to capture all that kind of information. And then we do the same thing with stream. We just have to do it manually right now where we create groups and channels in stream and wire those up so that as we do recordings from calls and such, we can pull that across as well. So basically, if I come back to my PowerPoint, uh, so we've we've got the OneNote in there. We actually have the planner together. We just haven't deployed it over to EUM demo. We're kind of pulling work from three different client projects together uh, to, to put this solution together. Um, and we do have the automation of the tabs into Teams there. So we've got most of the solution together from that point of view. And this is the channel request uh, SharePoint framework web part that I was talking about through there. You know, basically it writes to the SharePoint list, uh, triggers actually on a flow now in Azure Logic Apps uh, that then goes out. It creates the, the, the new channel in Teams. Uh, the document library folder gets created automatically by Microsoft. We don't have to do that, uh, but we do have to add the, the notebook section. Uh, when we're able to, we'll, we'll create the group channel in streams, and we can add the multi-plan into Planner, and then we can come back to Teams, and we can set the tabs up to connect all those together. And the beauty of that is, as people move between projects, because things are done in a consistent way, it makes it very easy to understand where everything is. Okay, all my, my project notes are in the OneNote, all my conversations are in the posts, my files are in SharePoint in the Files tab, the tasks that we need to work are in the Planner, all the recordings from my calls are in the, the Streams tab, and it's just all there. You know, People aren't searching around trying to understand, well, every project is organized differently, how do I navigate through this? Because it's been done on people's behalf, you know that automation provides a lot of standardization and consistency between all your different teams and even within your channels across your teams. So I see a huge amount of value from that point of view. So we've gone through the uh, the demo on that side of things. In fact, let me go back to the demo for a minute. I'm just curious if my um, other site finished provisioning through there. So if I come back to my main homepage. And I go to my SharePoint Framework web parts. Let's have a look at that sites list again. And we did have a webinar demo too that I created, which is, as I mentioned, just an out of the box communication site. So it's all set to go now. Uh, we've got the, uh, the communication site there. We didn't apply any template to this one, so that's part of the reason it ran pretty quickly from that point of view. But you can see, you know, I've requested a, a new site, a new team, what have you. It's gone through an approval process. The provisioning happens in the cloud automatically, um, and then an email notification goes out to the person that requested it saying, hey, your new team, your new site, uh, your new Office 65 group is here and ready to go. Uh, go wild. Have fun from there. So let's just recap what that looks like. So from a solution overview point of view, you know, we've got a, a list that's tracking all of this. Uh, from an existing sites and a new site request point of view, we've got the, the form that allows you to enter new requests, the, the flow or the logic apps that triggers off of that. We can do approvals as part of that, and then Azure Automation that wires all that together from there. Um, so I can show you a, a little more detail on that. So let me start with a quick mind map. I meant to have this open, but bear with me one second. There we go. So this is a great tool we use for uh, information architecture and, and structure. And it's basically showing us the uh, the structure of the EOM demo site. And actually, I've got another one here on the Teams provisioning. This is actually the more important one that I want to look at. <coughs> so 
we, we had a look at the sites list and this is where all the requests go in that form writes into that and that's where the workflow drives from to say hey I need to create a new team I need to create a new site uh, but there's actually a fair bit more under the hood through there there's a divisions list so I mentioned we've got that drop down in the form that lets you um, have different divisions in there so you just add new uh, divisions to the list and away you go from there We've got site templates, and site templates can belong to one or more divisions, so there's sort of a many-to-many a -many relationship between those two there. And then these content types are what drives how the form uh, behaves and presents itself. So we've got a, a general site request, but we can add additional columns and things that we want to have on them and, uh, and have those show up automatically in the form through there. So if you're comfortable doing SharePoint customizations in terms of adding columns to a content type, that's really all that you need to know understand how that all works together and the demo site as I mentioned you know we've got this section here that I would like to light up for people so they can come in and see under the hood a bit more of what that looks like so we've got the different lists for the divisions the site templates the sites and the channels and we've got some site columns and content types in there we actually have a library for for the templates that allow us to do the templating of those sites and I'll talk more about that in a minute and then we've got some resources up in Azure that hang all that together. So we've already had a look at the, the logic app side of things in terms of the workflow that's running this. Um, if I come back here for a minute and let's have a look at uh, the Azure automation. Actually, here's the one for the create site. You know, this is basically the PowerShell script that's running in the cloud. So we can see the one that just ran at 1230 today uh, to go and create that new communication site that we looked at through there. Uh, this is literally uh, PowerShell script. So this is all part of the GitHub that's published out. You have access to all these scripts that basically go through and, and do the provisioning. So if you're not familiar with PowerShell, this might look a little frightening to you, uh, but it is fairly understandable once you've got your head around PowerShell of, of the sequences and steps that it's going through of you know, creating a communication site versus a team site and the things that it needs to do there, you know, applying the template, creating the, the Microsoft team if it needs to, it kind of sequentially goes through all the, the steps as part of that. So I mentioned Power Automate, or uh, previously known as Flow. I mean, it's the workflow tool that's part of Office 65. That this is what we initially used as part of this. Uh, we've switched more to using Logic Apps. It's it's effectively the same thing. The the big difference that we see in our solution is that there isn't a pre-built approval in Logic Apps, but we're doing some really interesting things with. Um, adaptive cards and Outlook actionable messages to build even better, uh, in my opinion, approval processes and logic apps than we could have in Flow or Power Automate. So if we compare between those, I mean, Power Automate is a little simpler from a, a citizen developer point of view. Um, it has both standard and premium and custom connectors as part of it, and that drives some of the licensing. In fact, that drives part of the decision of, of why we've moved over to Logic Apps. You know, it, it does require you to go into the Azure portal, which for you know power users and citizen developers may be a little dangerous, maybe a little frightening for them because it is a very technical portal to, to go work in, but it does use all the same connectors. It's got all the same interface from that point of view. Big difference there is it's paper action uh, rather than a, a per user type of licensing. So it's much more cost effective. We look at the licensing differences between them. In Power Automate, if uh, if you stay within your Office 365 subscription, you know if you're just dealing with SharePoint and Exchange and things like that that run in O365, take your number of uh, subscribers in Office 365 and multiply it by 700. That's how many runs per month you get. So if your organization has a thousand people licensed for Office 365, you can do 700,000 runs of Power Automate per month with no extra charge for that. Problem is, as soon as you go outside of Office 65, and even calling out to Azure Automation to run our scripts for, for site provisioning is considered a, a premium connector, then you're into the per user plan or the per flow plan. So, you know, that same thousand users, suddenly it's $19,000 a month, which is a pretty significant dollar figure. Uh, you might want to look at licensing for flow at $600 per flow, but there is a minimum of five flow. So you're, you're at around the $3,000 a month uh, minimum charge there. Whereas the logic apps, they're priced per, per action and per connector. Yes, there are a lot of zeros after the decimal point in there, so you have to run a lot of actions to, to get up to significant dollars there. Um, it is a little more work to build it because of the lack of support for the approvals side, but since we've baked that in and we're going to open source that out, we've kind of eliminated that concern from, from your point of view there. So my, I'm going to follow up at the, the end, but I'm actually doing a webinar specific to Power Automate and Azure Logics. Logic Apps later in February, so I'm going to go much deeper into this topic in that session. 
Um, Azure Automation, I showed you briefly in the Azure portal. This is where we actually run the, the PowerShell scripts to drive this whole process. Like Logic Apps, it's also very cost effective. You know, you get 500 minutes of runtime included free per month. I'd be surprised if you consumed that amount of runtime doing site provisioning because you're not going to have that many teams requests coming through and it's you know two tenths of a cent per minute after that so you know literally cents the the caveat is that for both logic apps and azure automation you're probably going to spend less than a dollar a month on consumption costs in azure for it you still need to have a paid subscription for that so you need to either set up a, a pay as you go or an ea subscription in order to manage that but it's it's very cost effective I mentioned the SharePoint patterns and practices. A few folks, I think about 20%, um, have have used this before. It's an awesome resource if you're a SharePoint developer or an Office 65 IT pro. There's a ton of open source that both the Microsoft team and the community in general has published around that. Um, and there's a specific portion um, around SharePoint itself and around what they call their provisioning engine. And and what this is is the ability to to template and provision. SharePoint sites. And basically what you do is you start with a template site. So you go into to SharePoint, you set up a site the way that you want. So if you think about our example with our client sites, you know, we created the private documents library. We applied some uh, some content types and site columns into that as well. So we got that site the way we wanted every client site to look like. Um, and then basically you snapshot that. You, you run a, a PNP script and it turns it into an XML template file. Uh, and basically you can replay that. So you create a new out of the box empty site um, and you apply that template to it. And you basically get your net new site that's got all that configuration already done. It's not just libraries and site columns and content types, it's views, it's folders, it's permissions, you know, everything about that site. You, you set it up once the way you want it and then you, you replicate it and multi multiply it from there. So it's a great way to, to have a consistent structure on your SharePoint side of the house. Oh, I did have this slide in here. So I already showed you uh, sort of the information architecture around the provisioning side of things. So let's skip over that. Um, as I mentioned, it's all open source. So the, the link is in here and, and the deck will be available. So there's a GitHub path to my GitHub that has the V3 version of it. Um, we've been keeping that current as we've been doing, getting ready for this webinar. So everything I've been showing you is already up to date in GitHub. There's more we need to put in there. Uh, probably give us to, to the end of the week or so to, to wrap up what's in GitHub and get the white paper together on that as well. There is a link there to the previous white paper, but there's a new one that we're working on as part of that as well. <clears throat> so let's switch gears. We've only got a few minutes left in our, our, our session here. I want to talk about external sharing. So you know, take our example with Envision IT. We have sites and teams for every client. We have channels and, and folders for every project. Um, what about how do we share that with our clients themselves? We want them to be able to collaborate um, on some documents, view only on other documents. What does that look like? Well, there's a number of options that you have. And, and I give a talk on unstructured versus structured extranets, and, and we'll include a link to previous talk on that. Um, and your first choice is, well, let's just use the out-of-the-box sharing in Office 365, which is what we call unstructured sharing. So you can click on an individual document or a folder and just share that out. So if I come back to um, actually either SharePoint or Teams, I can do it from either interface. So if I come back to my SharePoint site here, let's actually go to our webinar demo site. So let me come over here to our sites list. Find that one again, and we come into our shared documents. So remember in our live demo folder that we had there, we uploaded a couple documents in there. Let's say I want to just share this change request document out. So I can click on the share link here, and I've got a number of choices. You know, I can I can share it with existing people, I can share it with specific people outside my organization. I haven't turned it on for this site, but I could share it with anyone with the link as well. And they could either edit or not. I can block download, I can set auto expiry on that. So I have a lot of control around how that sharing works. And that's just for that specific document, but I can actually do the same thing at the folder level. So if I wanted to share that entire folder. I could do that same share experience. I would have all those same choices and be able to do that. I could either copy that or directly send an email out to the people that I want to share that with. And that actually works really well. When you've got sort of one or two documents or a folder that you want to share with a small number of people, um, that unstructured sharing works really well. But what if I wanted to, to bring them into the, the site as a whole? You know, they're a client of ours and I want them to see this entire client site, except for the private document folders. 
um, what I can do is I can come in here and I can actually, oh, that's for the group, sorry. I want to come into the manage access for the, the site as a whole. Let me just go back to the home of the site. Just got to wait for the gear to show up. There we go. And I can come into my site permissions here. So I've got my standard through here, but I can actually come into my advanced SharePoint permissions if I'm comfortable. I can actually grant permissions to people through there. And then I could go into that private documents and, and remove inheritance and take uh, that new person's permission away. So they only see the site as a whole with the exception of that documents folder. So I can manage that. And, and when I'm doing that through SharePoint, under the hood, I'm actually using what's called Azure Active Directory B2B or business to business. So it's it's doing the sharing at the Active Directory level. It's actually sh exposed through the SharePoint level. And there's different experiences that people will have when they get invited in that way, whether they already have an Azure AD account or not. Again, my previous webinars go into more detail on that site. Now, I may want to bring them into the entire team. So I could say, okay, if I come over into my team here, go into webinar here, I can manage the, the team as a whole, and I can add new members. And depending on what rules we've set up in Teams, whether we're allowed to share externally at the team level or not, I could actually put an external email address in here, and that person will get invited to the, the Microsoft team itself. And as a result of that, they'll have access to everything the team has, which typically, unless you've changed it, is the SharePoint team site under the hood as well. There's reasons why you may or may not want to do that. Um, the way we work, we, we consider our Microsoft team for the client private to our organizations. So that's where we have all of our conversations internally uh, that we're, we're not necessarily sharing with the client, and we use email where we're engaging into the client. And in some ways, it's nice to have that separation. I mean, you could use private channels and teams to do a similar kind of thing there as well. The other challenge that I find is that um, at least today, the ability to context switch between different tenants in Teams is not great. So, you know, getting notified that you've got things in somebody else's tenants team is difficult. And I find if I get invited into someone else's team as an external, I often miss conversations there because I'm so focused on my Envision IT teams. I'm just not opening up browser windows or, or switching my context in my Teams client into those other teams. And I just don't see those things going by. Uh, so it's something to bear in mind. A, a lot of people, it's one of the top things in user voice, uh, complaining to Microsoft saying, hey, make it easier to, to, to see you know, multiple organizations in one Teams interface and, and that sort of context switching go away from that point of view. So that was option two that we were talking about. We kind of bled into option three, which is you know, make them a member of the Microsoft team itself, which by nature puts them in the Office of Divide group under the hood as well. And then option four is where our product comes in. You can actually do structured sharing as part of that as well. And what that means is that we provide governance around creation of groups through our external user manager product that you can invite people into. Under the hood, we're using Azure Active Directory B2B. So let me show you quickly what this looks like. If I come say to my, uh, these groups are actually wired up into our, our test drive tenant on our website. Uh, we can see the team under the hood here, through, through here. We actually got a, an EUM groups web part here. So right in Teams, um, again, with some governance and structure around that, I can invite people in through this web part. So I can say, hey, I just want to add a new user. We've got a lot of other interesting scenarios in here as well. We can provide registration links that you can give to people that they can self-discover sites or uh, in the public case or in a private case, they need to be provided that link to be able to join that group and come into that site. You can actually see this yourself. If you go over to our extra user manager website, click on test drive, if we come into the, the B2B path, which is all about Office 365 and say, try that out, um, you'll see the groups in here. And, and we can see the ability to, to join a public group. So this is actually showing me this public group no approval corresponds to this team over here, which corresponds to a, a SharePoint site as well. So it all kind of wires together. Um, and this is a very nice scenario where there's no approval on this particular one. I can actually go through this process, self-register, sign up, join the group and, and live get right into the, the Office 55 site. So you can do that yourself. You can click that link there. Um, you can actually take this shortcut path. It'll take you through that as well and, and get right into that group and right into our EUM demo, SharePoint.com tenant from there. So pretty cool from that point of view. So let me just wrap up back on the uh, the presentation side of things. So I, you know this kind of explains what I've already talked about in terms of how we share from an Envision IT point of view. 
some additional resources here. Uh, so there's a, a past webinar here on the unstructured versus structured and a link to the test drive that I was just showing you. Encourage you to check that out. Um, and just to wrap up before we run out of time, some wrap up points to think about in here um, and some upcoming events. As I mentioned, I'm gonna be doing the Power Automate and Azure Logic Apps later in February. I'm actually doing that if you're local in the Toronto area as a talk at the next Toronto SharePoint Users Group. I should put that on this slide here. It's the third Wednesday in February. Um, Logan and I are going to be down at the SharePoint Conference in Las Vegas in May. We're also going to be just outside of Munich at the Euro European Collaboration Summit in June. And I just hit the one o'clock mark, so uh, got my timing down nicely from that point of view. Um, hopefully, if there was questions, they got answers as we went through. We don't really have time to, to recap on that. Uh, but if there is outstanding ones, we will follow up through email from there. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Hope that was an informative talk. We've got a lot of resources out, a lot more coming. Uh, so you'll see a follow-up email from us in the next day or two with the recording and the deck. Um, and then we'll have that Teams provisioning site page updated with the white paper and, and all the resources there shortly as well. So thanks very much. Have a great rest of your day.